I want to start out this morning by reading together Philippians chapter 2. And I, I put, I asked for several verses to be in the screen. So I don't know for sure whether they will be in the order that I use them. That's not anybody's fault. It's my fault. So Philippians chapter 2 verses um, let's start at verse 6. This is talking about Jesus, by the way. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Lord, speak from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been in the Apostles' Creed. We've been studying this document, which can be traced back well over a thousand years. It wasn't written by the apostles, but it, is, it can be traced directly back to the apostles' beliefs. Just to clarify a side note here, we often use the word apostle and disciple interchangeably. There's a slight difference between the two. The apostles that Jesus called were the people that he called and he trained and he sent personally. Generally, the Bible refers to a disciple as any follower of Jesus. That's why at one place in Scripture, Paul, who never met Jesus during his earthly life, defends his own apostleship. He says, I am an apostle because Jesus appeared to me on the road and sent me. So when we say the Apostles' Creed, we're not just saying this was what the original disciples, the people that followed Jesus believed. They're saying this is what the inner circle, what the direct followers of Jesus believed. So just a side note there. Now, I do want to remind you of two things, one that we've touched on already, the other one that I want to add to that. One is that we had said that believe is a Transitive verb. A transitive verb is a verb that goes somewhere. If I just um, slap, that doesn't really make sense. If I slap the podium, that's a transitive verb. It means you do it to something. And when we say we believe, we don't just say we believe Although our society wants to believe that, you got to believe in what? Well, you've got to believe in something. So we want to remember that when we talk about what we believe, we are talking about specific things. The second thing I want to point out about belief is that you can't, in the Bible, separate mental belief from Active belief. Now, in a Western society, in the United States, we often believe, yeah, well, I believe this in my head, but I don't know whether it is lived out in my life, in my hands. But in those days, in the days that Jesus walked on the earth, in the societies and cultures that the Bible was written, there could not be a separation between what you believe in your head and what you believe in your hands. Now, I think we all know that there sometimes is an inconsistency, right? 
There are things that we believe in our brains and in our hearts that don't make it to our lives. But in the Bible, there is not a separation between what gets in my head and what gets in my hands. In fact, a Greek thinker in the days of Jesus would have said, if it doesn't make it into your hands, you don't believe it. In fact, if you read 1 John, you will pretty much see that spoken directly or indirectly several times. In intellectual belief does not stand alone. And in fact, in 1 John 5, we won't go there right now, there's a, a series that is not dominoes because it's one domino that goes from belief to love, to obedience. Because we believe that Christ died for us, because we believe in God, that leads to love inevitably, and that love leads to obedience. 1 John chapter 5 basically says, if it doesn't make it to obedience, you're not really believing. And the reason I tell you that is that as we dig into this next section of the Apostles' Creed, well, you'll see it. Declaring what we believe places the focus on what we believe, on who we believe in. It places our lives under the authority of God. When we say together we believe, we are saying, God, we don't just believe in you. We place ourselves under your authority. Now, we know that there are other things that are going to draw our eyes away. There are other things that we believe. There are other things that we wrestle with. But ultimately, when we say this, We are saying, you are the authority, God. You are the center. One of the best ways for me to think about this is um, they tell me I was never a ballerina, okay? But when they spin in ballet, the way you do that, and you've seen that on TV or in movies where they spin and this just, It's amazing. They're so quick, and their heads snap around. And because I'm unstable, I won't try to do this a lot. But they pick a point on the wall, and they spin, and they whip their head back around. And as long as they keep that spot in their eyes and in their mind, as long as that's the focus, everything else can happen. Life can spin and go crazy, but you've got that thing. And we all choose what is that thing that we're going to always snap our eyes back to, right? And when we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, when we read these things through, we are saying, God, you and your son Jesus and the story that the Bible tells us and the Holy Spirit and all of that, that is the truth that our eyes snap back to. And so we come to the point in the Apostles' Creed when we say, um, we've already talked about Jesus and we say he was He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. There's a flow there. Do you see the flow? We see it in Philippians 2. The flow is descent. In Philippians 2, verse 6, it says, He was in nature God. He was enthroned with God in heaven. Jesus, the Son, was there. I mean, think about it. He was worshiped by the angels. He was on the throne. You think you've lost the status at some point in your life. He was equal with God the Father. He did not consider that something to be grasped. 
The NIV said it did not consider it something to be used with, to his own advantage. Another translation says it did not, he did not consider it something to be held on to, to be grasped. He said, I'm going to let that go. I'm going to lower myself. And then it goes on. He said, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. It's like he goes from the throne. He steps from the throne. He comes to mankind. He doesn't just come down here. He comes down here as a person. He comes, not just a person, but a baby. Not just a baby, but a poor baby in a a poor back roads kind of place. And then he spends his life giving and lowering and descending and descending and descending, being a friend to sinners. He spends his life not showing people what power is, but showing people that ultimately power is demonstrated in the release of power. And then he's arrested and he continues to descend. And the ultimate descent in some ways is when he's nailed to the cross. He's descending. Do you see that? over and over and over again. And what he experienced on the cross was not just physical pain, but it's clear from Scripture that he is bearing the sin and the guilt and all of the burden of all of the sin of all of mankind from the beginning up to today. You know, the sins we are going to live out today Jesus paid for on the cross 2,000 years ago. Descent, 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 descent. He descended into hell. Now, I'll be honest. Theologians don't know what to make of that. Because I think, honestly, at a certain point, We don't know. I mean, whenever we start to talk about what happens after we die, especially when we talk about what happened after Jesus died, like where did he spend Saturday? Well, we know he spent Saturday physically in the tomb, but where was the spirit of? Scripture says that he descended to hell, that he preached to the captives. What does that mean? And I will tell you this with great authority. Anybody that answers that question with great authority doesn't know what they're talking about. So there I preached with authority the fact that I have no idea. But we know... It's a descent, descent. In fact, one of the best phrases that I ever heard used on this, it said, Jesus chose to descend into greatness. There's a very real sense in what the the book of Philippians is saying to to us and what the Apostles' Creed is saying to us is, Jesus descended and lowered himself and lowered himself and lowered himself. Or maybe the word is humbled himself and humbled himself and humbled himself and humbled himself. And no matter how low he got, he said, I'm going to go as low as it needs to be because I love my people. Now, Descent is not natural for us, right? I mean, honestly, how many of us really what we want is to really get as little affirmation 
and comfort and success as possible. How many of us would say, that's what I want. I want my life to be as low and unappreciated as possible. I mean, I'm going to talk positively about moms later, but right now, I mean, moms. Well, let's talk to those of, those of us who are not moms. One of the worst things you can ever do is forget to acknowledge Mother's Day, right? Ooh, that, that hurts. Because you know what? Moms, rightfully, want to be appreciated. We all do. But Jesus said, descend. He modeled it for us, and he called us to it. In fact, I think that descent and what the Bible teaches about status and authority and recognition and fame and comfort, all of that is more unnatural than we realize. Here's a, a way to think about this. Maybe I've shown this to you before, but let's do it again. I want you to... Fold your hands, interlocking your fingers. Okay, as you did that, one of your thumbs is on top. How many of you would, the left thumb is on top? Okay, that's the right way to do it. No, there, some of you have it with your right thumb on top. Here's what's interesting. That's not necessarily a function of whether you're right-handed or left-handed. You would think that being right-handed or left-handed would form that, but it isn't. You see, we have things that are just natural, normal ways to think and function. And you have a finger. In fact, do it the other way. It feels weird, doesn't it? Your homework is this. Cross your arms and then reverse it. You, you almost can't, can you? You're like, some of you are like. Uh, uh, uh. We have all kinds of things about the way we think and act and function that are normal to us. Even though we're not consciously aware of them. Those of you that drove here this morning, you did not have to think, okay, America, right side of the road. Although, you know, if you live in London, it's, uh, it is a little odd, isn't it? It's, we have all kinds of things that are natural to us, and one of them is a set. We find in our hearts and in our society that our natural tendency is to want to be first. Isn't it? I mean, Genesis 3, God creates Adam and Eve, creates the world, and it is good, and ultimately, you know what caused them to fall? They wanted to be like God. They didn't want to be second. They wanted to know. They wanted to be in control. We see this in Genesis 3. We see this in our babies, right? How old is a child when they first are like, even if they can't say mine, they say, me, right? And then you grow up and you get married and that all goes away because we're not selfish anymore, right? We have in our hearts, both internal and external, 
We yell with Sally from Charlie Brown. All I want is what's coming to me. All I want is my fair share. And Jesus models and tells us, descend, descend, give up your fair share, humble yourselves, because he did. See, Matthew 20 is offensive. Now, if you've lived in church a lot of your life, you don't maybe re remember how offensive it is, but this is what happens in Matthew 20. I didn't put it in the screens, but Jesus tells a parable. He says, you know, there was a, a landowner who hired some workers first thing in the morning. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to pay you. It's a fair amount. They said, okay. Then a little while later, he realized, I have more work than I need, realized. I'm going to go get some more. More workers come. And then at noon, more workers come. And then at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, more workers come. And at the end of the day, the landowner, Jesus says, pays all of them a full day's, full day's wages. Now, we live in a union, strong, fairness society. And I'm not saying anything bad about unions. But, man, somebody should have grieved this. Come on. Jesus said, are you bothered? Because God is gracious? He's calling those early workers to swallow their own pride and not demand fairness. It's crazy stuff. That's kind of offensive, isn't it? I mean, it's not offensive unless you make it real life and we wouldn't want to make Scripture real life, would we? And then it goes on in this same passage. Jesus says, okay, I'm going to go and die. So he's saying, look, what I'm telling you about fairness and about humbling yourself and about not demanding things, I'm going to live that out. And then... The mother of James and John comes to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus. I'm sure she took him off to the side and whispered, Hey, Jesus, in the kingdom, can my son sit on your right and your left? Because no mom has ever asked a coach or anybody for special treatment for their kids, have they? And Jesus says, ascent is not the point. Descent is the point. Look at what Jesus did in Philippians 2. He lowered himself. He left heaven. He took on suffering. I mean, sometime in the next couple weeks, we will, well, not we, we'll bring in the people from Service Mechanical and they'll flip over the HVAC from heat to air conditioning. And we will have a moment of intense prayer that the air conditioning will work. Because ah, surely we can't sweat for Jesus. Now, I understand. I want air conditioning. But how sad is it that part of me is as concerned about my comfort or I'm more impressed by my comfort than that Jesus left heaven.
Now, if the air conditioning doesn't work, it, it's going to sound like I'm trying to make you feel guilty, but I'm not. Um, here's what Jesus did in Matthew 27. I want to walk through this. Sometimes we only do this around Easter. Psalm Matthew 27 at verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene. Jesus has already been beaten to the point that he can't even carry the cross on his own. He has been mocked. He has been laughed at. This Jesus who was the, and still is, the Son of God who has lowered himself and lowered himself and lowered himself. He has been beaten and humiliated and mocked and rejected. They meet a man from Cyrene named Simon, forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, Golgotha which means the place of the skull. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against them. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. They were mocking. The beautiful, perfect, spotless Son of God has descended this far. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved, him, saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And it goes on and it says that for three hours there was darkness and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And finally, in verse 50, when Jesus has cried out again, in a loud voice, he gave up his. Descent, 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 descent. Now I want to say two things as we wrap this up. One, I intentionally started in Philippians 2 at verse 6. Verse 6 is when it says, this is what Jesus did. But verse 5 of Philippians 2 says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, that, that's a different thing, right? Right? I mean, it's one thing to say, wow, look what Jesus did for us. Look how Jesus lowered himself and humbled himself and gave himself. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for 
reading this passage and letting me know how much God loves me. But then Paul says, be like that. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul? See, Jesus is not just saying, be like this. He's saying, that's the way it works. That sacrificing yourself, lowering yourself, is the only way to climb the ladder. The only way to be exalted is to lay down your It's not ultimately only a command. It's a statement of fact. Like, remember when you were young and you could jump? You know, jumping when both feet leave the ground at the same time? Jaron can still do it. I've seen him. Um, Nobody has to say to you, okay, you jumped, now come down. Happens kind of naturally, doesn't it? Gravity is there. That's the way the world works. Jesus is saying to us, you got to come down. It's the only way He's calling us to descend with him. Why don't we like it? I, I came up with three general reasons we don't like to descend. One is comfort, right? I mean, being at the top of the heap, playing king of the hill is fun if you're the king of the hill. It's comfortable. We want to be on top. Another reason is pride. I can actually remember this. In about sixth grade, after school one day, we were on this hill. Um, there was this um, house being built in the town, and it was kind of right next to the school, and some of us were playing king of the hill. And, well, the boys were playing because Girls generally don't play that because they're smarter than that. But I remember this moment when I was, for a moment, king of the hill. I'd pushed all the other boys off. They must have been third graders. I was in sixth grade. But I remember vividly looking over and this girl, Laura, that was kind of my idea of the perfect sixth grade girl was looking at me. And in my mind, at that moment, she was thinking, Mark. Pretty sure that wasn't the reality of the situation, but there's something about being that guy that feels so good. So we don't like to descend because of comfort. We don't like to descend because of pride. We don't like to descend, third reason, because of self-centeredness, right? It's about me. But Jesus is saying, descend with me. And Scripture teaches that ultimately what God calls us to is to answer the call of Jesus to deny ourselves. Now, 
what's your favorite movie? There's a pretty good chance that your favorite movie features someone who denies themselves. Think about it. If you're a Marvel movie fan, Iron Man gives his life. Boromir gives his life in Lord of the Rings. Russell Cass in Independence Day flies his plane up into the alien ship, gives himself for others. Spock says, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one as he gives his life. Bruce Willis in Armageddon. Dumbledore. A couple years ago, my friend Bob, who I went to college with, who went to South Africa as a missionary, his life ended after 17 years of ALS. The last five to seven years, he didn't speak. He had a box that he would, that was a voice generating box. He didn't leave his wheelchair for 10 years. And he served until the day. Jesus calls us to that. And just a side note, Jesus was a friend to sinners. It's one of the main things that they criticized him for. He had lowered himself. He'd hung out with people like that. This morning as I drove to church, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Mark, are you a friend of sinners? That's part of what it means to lower yourself. Why would Jesus do this? Not for good people. The Bible says that we were enemies of God. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for your friends. But we weren't his friends. We were his enemies. Do you understand that outside of Jesus, we're not good people? I mean, we like to think, well, I'm a good person, but I lie sometimes. So I'm a good person, but I lie. I'm a good person, but I hate. I'm a good person, but I don't keep my promises. Ultimately, we end up saying, I'm a good person except the fact that I'm an idolatrous, adulterous, hateful, murdering, thieving, good person. Why would Jesus do that? Because he loves us. John 3.16 is good news. For God so loved the world that he gave us one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. But 3.17 might be even better. For he did not come to condemn the world, but that we might be saved. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, he did it 
for the joy that was set before him. And Revelation 5 says this. In heaven, people are singing to Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you are slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. Why did he do it? Because he loves us. 